you have enough information, the, the, the case in the case interview starts to feel more like an HPS case. You have information. So now it's like you're the protagonist. What would you do? You, know, you actually have data. So you go from sort of blank piece of paper to information, potential charts, data. Okay. So you ask the standard question. I think I demonstrated that earlier. Next, you go deeper down the branch if the data suggests you could. If your hypothesis is correct, you keep drilling down. All right? If your hypothesis is wrong, you go back up. Okay, so an example of that is my hypothesis is that revenues, a decline in revenues is causing the profitability problem. Do we have any data that would suggest that to be, do we have any data on whether revenues have changed? Okay. The interviewer might say, yes. Revenues have, in fact, gone down. Hmm. My hypothesis so far has been confirmed. I will go deeper in that direction. If the interviewer says, actually, revenues have gone up. That's interesting. How can profits go down when revenues have gone up? Oh, it must mean that it's a cost problem. I'm going to go up the framework. And I'll draw this out in a second so you can see it. I'm going to go up the framework and move over to cost. And the last step, which I demonstrated, is, is you want to continuously refine your hypothesis. And, and it's actually a good habit to um, say out loud how your hypothesis is changing. And so I didn't ever use the word hypothesis. I sort of just did it implicitly. But, uh, but they could sort of tell, ah, you know, that's kind of odd that revenues would sort of go up and profits are down. Must be a cost problem. So it's better if you say that out loud. In general, it's, it's good to think out loud. And literally, like, oh, that's kind of odd. You know, I'll, I'll, literally, I'll literally say that. Um, because it's easier. If you just say what's in your mind, <laughs> it, then you don't have to sort of think whether you should sort of censor it or not. Okay, so you guys all get that? Okay, ask for information on where to start within the framework, say the hypothesis, pick a branch of the framework to start, identify key issues within the branch, ask standard questions to gather initial data, which is again very formulaic, then go deeper down the branch if the data suggests you should. If you run into a dead end, which is very common, sometimes they'll do it deliberately. They'll deliberately send you down a dead end to see if you figure out it's a dead end. You've got to come back up the framework and move over to somewhere else. Okay? And then continue to refine your hypothesis and state what information you need to test whether that hypothesis is correct. Okay? That's important because that's what you do in real life. You know? So our hypothesis is that sales have gone down in the United States because sales in the Midwest region have really tanked. But all the other regions are fine. OK, interesting idea. How do we go figure that out? Oh, we got to go do a data dump to the, like, the guy in finance and go figure that out. OK, that's worth half a day. Um, so we're, we're trying to simulate that here. <coughs> what you don't want to do, this is very linguistic, but it's important. What you don't want to do is just ask really open-ended questions. Like, do we have any information on the business situation? Right? Then it's like, no, 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 no. Right? You got to be more specific than that. Okay? So you tell them what your hypothesis is, and then you tell them what specific piece of information you need to determine whether that hypothesis is true or not. Because that's what you would do in real life. Because gathering information in real life and consulting is expensive. It's counted in days. And there are only so many days you have available to get a problem solved. Okay? So they want to see that. You can see if you can do that in a case situation. Oops. Thank you. OK, so let me illustrate what going deeper means. Okay. Going back to my earlier example, you don't have to copy the top part. You can just, it's just more of a visual diagram you sort of I want to illustrate. Um, if the example was profits are down 20%, uh, we're looking at revenues and we're looking at costs, do we know if revenues have gone up, down, or stay the same? Okay. And the interviewer says uh, revenues, in fact, have, uh, have decreased. Oh, interesting. Okay. That mean if I so we had earlier we had sort of profit cost, right? So up until now, in the case, I've drawn that. Right? And now that I have data that says revenues in fact have gone down, interesting. That means it's likely to be a revenue problem. I'll say, how much have revenues gone down by? They've gone down, in fact, they've gone down by 20%. Oh, precisely the same amount as profits have gone down. Seems reasonable that mathematically, it seems like this is really a revenue problem, a revenue decline problem, not really a profitability problem. So 
to further understand why revenues have gone down by 20%, we need to look at the component parts of revenue. And I'll say, there's two things I want to know next. I want to break apart revenues and look at number of units sold times the average revenue per unit, which is basically like price. So price times volume sold is sort of your total revenues. Do we have any information on whether the number of units have, have sold have changed or not? Have they gone up, down, or stayed the same? And so the interview might then say, um, actually, the number of units sold have not changed. We sold a million units last year. We sold a million units this year. Interesting. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, so obviously then, I wouldn't say obviously because that's a little bit of a snobby word. But OK, so revenues have gone. So profits have sort of you know, declined by 20%. And revenues have declined by 20%. Okay. Units sold have not changed. Okay. It must mean that prices have gone down by 20%. Do we have any information on whether that's true or not? Yes, in fact, prices are down by 20%. OK, great. So the real problem here is not whether the profits are down, it's not that revenues have declined, it's that we're, for some reason, prices have declined by 20% in this particular situation. And then you just, you just keep drilling down, right? Just sort of, the reason I like sort of profit and loss cases, at least for practice early on, is they're sort of the most mathematically complete. It's either or. It's very, very clean. So it's a very good way to sort of practice this, go down a tree, come back up a tree. Uh, the other ones are a little, they're a little more they're squishier. Uh, the way it's not quite mathematically clean, there's a lot more overlap. So I like practicing them in terms of the actual analytical skills. And you'll just keep drilling down further and further and further. Okay? So you can see as you go through this process, you, you, the case starts looking more like an HBS case. You're having data, and you get a sense of what's going on, um, and you sort of get closer and closer to that. OK, so what happens, though, if you run into a dead end? So I want to show you what a dead end looks like and uh, what it sounds like and what you visually want to do. Okay. So let's go back to the original case. Um, profits are down 20%. Uh, we need to look at revenues or costs. Have revenues or costs changed? Actually, have, um, uh, do we know if, um, do we have any information or do you have any suggestions on, as to where to start? The interviewer says no. Let's look at revenues first. My hypothesis is revenues have declined. That's why profits have dropped by 20%. Do we have any information on whether or not profits have, uh, revenues have changed? Um, in fact, revenues have actually increased by 20%. Oh, that's interesting. Revenues have increased by 20%, yet profits have declined by 20%. Must not be a revenue problem. Okay. So let's focus on cost next. Okay. This means costs have probably gone up quite significantly. So to understand, and, and is that true? Yes, in fact, costs have actually gone up by 30 or 40%. Okay, so we're looking at a cost problem. So we need to actually understand what's causing, what's driving the cost problem. There are two components to cost. Okay. Number of units sold and the cost per unit. Okay. So mathematically, you multiply the two together, and that gets you the cost, right? Do we have any information as to whether or not the number of units uh, sold has changed in this particular situation. Okay. Uh, yes, we have information on that. In fact, the number of units sold has stayed the same. How interesting. Okay. So if costs have declined by minus 40%, units sold has not changed, then it must mean the cost per unit has gone down. Gone, I'm sorry. Costs have gone up by 40%. Units sold hasn't changed. That must mean that cost per unit has gone up 40%. Is that, tr is that true? In fact, it is. And then you just keep drilling down. So you see the branch. Back up the hierarchy, go down the other hierarchy. So I like to think of it as sort of um, roots in a tree. Right? You sort of go down one, you come back up, and you go down the other one. So, so visually, you want to sort of convey that. And uh, actually, honestly, it's worth uh, practicing penmanship. Because you know, you're sitting in a case interview, and I tend not to write very cleanly. So I actually have to slow down and practice writing. And if you're doing it on a whiteboard, you have to write bigger letters, which is, a, I mean, it seems really silly, but it's a different mechanical skill. You know, and, I don't, and I've never really written on a chalkboard. And so it, it's just, it, you know, and then you draw, if you draw too big, then you run out of space. I mean, so like a lot of very practical things. It's worth practicing on a flip chart, worth practicing on a paper pad, um, and, and then sometimes a whiteboard is sort of easy too. The thing with a whiteboard is you want to make sure you're, you're comfortable with the pen so you don't like <coughs> stick yourself. So you have like ink on your shirt. It's not good. <laughs> It's all about details. Question? I mean, yes? The number of units sold mm -hmm. is increased. If you increase the revenue, does that at the same time the percentage? And if so, why is it increased by 
because I have a bad poor mathematical example. Yeah. So these aren't all meant to sort of be tied out. But then you're right. So mathematically, you would be correct. You're going to do well. <laughs> OK, so here's some tips for analyzing cases. Uh, other thing, too, just to back up a second. You find that when um, interviewers give cases, they either give cases that they actually have live experience with and hard data in their head, or they'll make it up. Okay? And so for this example, I was, I'm just making stuff up. More to illustrate a point. Uh, OK, um, here are some tips. Think out loud. Okay, it's useful. Um, if you're struggling, you really don't know what to do. But if you think out loud, and you're sort of thinking out loud too long, and they know you're sort of stuck, I mean, they don't, I mean, they don't want to be in a room with an awkward situation either, right? <laughs> so, so they'll help you. You know, they might sort of quote, you know, deduct you like two points for style or whatever. Um, but if you think out loud, I'm, I'm stuck, that they'll actually help you. Um, Use hypotheses a lot, like I just demonstrated earlier. I think it's this. Let me get data to verify and, and sort of move on. And uh, you don't have to write the parts underneath. It's, it's about taking an educated guess, figuring out what data you need to sort of figure out whether you're not right or wrong, and then validate, and then refine that hypothesis. Ask for more data, see that hypothesis is correct, and you just keep on moving. OK, uh, there, there are a couple of types of analyses you want to do fairly regularly. And, and I'll mention this a couple of times. Um, but a lot of people sort of, if they're not experienced with it, they sort of forget to do this. So this, is, this happens literally 90% of cases I do this. The first is um, what I call figuring out if the problem is a company-specific issue or an industry-wide issue. So like on the, the earlier example, if units sold has declined by 20%. The next question I might ask, do we have any information on how the rest of the market's doing? So is it a 20% decline for us because we screwed something up? Or is it 20% across the board? It's a market issue. You solve those two problems very differently. You respond to them very differently. So that's a very common analysis I'll ask for data on, company specific or across the board. Uh, second thing I always ask for is uh, I try to find the trend line. So where are we this year? Where was it last year? Sometimes where was it the year before? I'm looking for the chain. I'm sorry, look, look, looking for the, the trend. And oftentimes you'll find that um, the most common trend you'll see is around growth. I mean, that's sort of the one that I sort of saw the most. You'll, you'll oftentimes have uh, a company will be in sort of four different businesses. One will be going like gangbusters and one will be sort of like dying. On average, they're doing fine, right? But on average, the average is always sort of, and the totals always sort of lie. They're misleading. You have to break things up into its parts because then you might say, okay, well, do you want to solve the problem with a company that's, that's sort of flailing or do you want to sort of take the one that's working and make it better? Like that would be a conversation you might have in a case. Uh, other things to do, um, always segment your numbers. Okay, I'll, I have specific segmentation strategies too, I'll show you. Um, but if revenues are down, for example, you know it's a revenue problem, and units, and units sold are, have declined, let's say, um, you want to sort of break up that total. So total units sold have declined. What composes units sold? Right? Um, and do we have any information on the sources of where the units sold and whether those have changed? In fact, we do. You know, units sold in, in North America has stayed constant. Asia has gone up 20%. Europe's gone down 20%. I see. So units sold has gone down by 20% in Europe. Do we know that's a company-specific issue or an industry-wide issue? How are the competitors doing on volume in terms of Europe? Uh, in fact, Europe, the European competitors are also down 20% in volume. Ah, I see. So we have an industry problem, a market problem in Europe, which is suppressing European sales, which is dragging down overall sales, overall units sold for the company. Okay. And so I'll sort of synthesize that. Um, and, but you don't, you don't get to that insight right, until you sort of break apart the numbers. And there's, like, like, there's an infinite number of ways to sort of break apart numbers in, in real life. Um, I usually like to ask the interviewer, so you, you say we need to break apart the numbers. Do we have any more, detail, do we have any more, do we have any more details on what, it, what comprises you know, units sold? Okay. Um, because on units sold, it could be by channel. Right? Internet channels up 20%, direct sales force is down 15%. It could be by, by region. It could be by product line. The super duper product is up, sales are up 20%, but the basic product is down 20%. 
Um, and so you could literally sort of do that all day long, and, and in real life you would, because you don't know. Um, but they don't want to waste time doing that. So you sort of you make the case that you need to break it apart, and then you ask them if there's any information, and they usually give it to you. Because right? they don't want to like, make up numbers either, because then you get, you get embarrassed by you know, people who are really sharp on their numbers. Right? Um, OK, segment your numbers, and then I mentioned earlier, uh, always ask for data. Okay? Always ask. And again, the key with asking is make, explain why you want the data first. You get credit for asking the right question, which is very important in consulting. And then when they give you the data, then you kind of proceed. If you ask for the data without asking, explaining why you want it, you don't get points for asking the right question. Okay? So you've got to use the words like, we need to sort of break apart. We need to look at the segments that drive you know, unit shipments. Do we have any data on the individual segments? Okay? So that's a good word to use. Because segments can mean segmentation in a lot of different patterns, right? By region, by channel, by type of customer. But you say the word segments, like, OK, guy, the person knows what they're talking about. They're going to segment stuff. I'll save them some time. We should segment by region, because that's where the insight is. Great. Um, so if you just use the word segments, or break it apart, or in those words, they will give you data on how to do that. Or will give you the actual segmentation pattern that's most productive. All right. Uh, mechanically speaking, here's how to close a case, and then we'll get into some actual cases. It's really a, a three-step process. As you're sort of gathering all this information, you have these hypotheses, you're sort of driving down various analyses, your case in the interview starts looking a lot more like an HBS case. Okay? And then towards the end of the case interview, it's more like a cold call. What would you do if you're the protagonist? in this situation, or what would you do, what would you tell the client to do? Okay. Um, the, one, the thing you need to work on here, first off, is just figuring out what's important. And I'll give you a demo of that in a second. What's the important idea? What's the big aha? What's the big insight? Um, by the way, one of the biggest compliments you can sort of pay to a colleague in consulting is really insightful. You know, that was really insightful, which is basically not obvious, but spot on. Okay. So figuring out what's important. And that's sort of an internal process. Then you want to actually say it out loud and give a point of view, a conclusion, preferably a conclusion with a recommendation on, on action the client should take or likely actions the client might want to consider. I'm hedging again, right? If I don't have enough data to know definitively they should do that, I'll say, it would seem to me that you know, doing a pilot program of some sort in the new emerging market would be useful given it's going 50% per year when the market's market is only going 2%. And then you want to support your point of view with data. Okay. And so, um, at least McKinsey, I don't know what the other firms call it, but we call the synthesis. Taking all this information and like building up something, one thing. What's the one answer that we're looking for? And I also sort of Google the definition of synthesis. Uh, it means to combine separate elements to form a coherent whole. Which basically means taking all the Lego blocks on the floor, building a house. Ah, it's a house, right? I understand what to do now. So analysis is all about pulling apart the pieces into its component parts. Synthesis is then all this analysis, putting it back together into a coherent whole so a client can make sense of it. And I, it's, it's, it's the opposite of analysis. That's interesting. Um, let's see. By the way, I'm, I'm recording this event. I'm going to refer to like page numbers and slide numbers just so it's on the recording. Um, you guys will get access to all this after the fact, too. So if you see me sort of referring to page numbers that don't exist, you'll, you'll know why. Um, the common structure, by the way, of a close, just visually speaking, it, it sort of looks like this. And you guys want to be already familiar with it. You don't actually sort of draw it out necessarily. But you're, um, you always start with the conclusion, well, not always, but in most cases, you start with the conclusion, ABC company should consider exiting the European market. How come? Uh, market sales have tanked. Cost structure of the business is too high. And so you have your, your sort of supporting elements underneath your conclusion. Okay? So there's an order to it. You start with the conclusion first. A lot of people start with the data first. 
And I'll show you what that sounds. There's a, there's a certain rhythm. If you listen to it, it's almost like, almost like music. There's a certain rhythm to how a poor close goes versus a good close versus a great close. Always conclusion first, and then the, the key supporting elements underneath. Usually, it's like two or three things. There's a useful book um, that a lot of people swear by. <laughs> I actually never read it, but I think I've learned it sort of through osmosis. It's called The Pyramid Principle. Uh, have you guys heard of that? Okay. Uh, there's this book called The Pyramid Principle. It's by Barbara Minton. I'll, I'll put up the name in a, a, little, in a second. And um, it's, the, it's the communication. It's, it's, I think it's a book about critical thinking, logical thinking, and writing. Um, sort of every McKinsey consultant sort of uses that, whether they realize it or not. I, I use it without realizing it. Others have done it more deliberately. And a lot of the consulting firms use it. And it has to do with structuring your communication in a very rigorously logical way. Uh, and it's a, it's a good skill to have. And, and it's different. It's a little different um, in some cases, depending on how you were sort of taught to write. So I got a lot out of that. Um, but that's the structure. It's sort of big idea up front, and then three main ideas underneath that sort of support that. Uh, almost look like an expository writing essay from high school, if you're familiar with that. Okay, I want to give you um, examples of closes. And I want you to just hear what it sounds like. And I'm going to, I'm going to take my crack at using sort of a, a non-business example, because I think it sort of helps convey the point. Okay, um, the, the rhythm of a poor close is like this. Data, 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 part of a conclusion, data, data, another part of a conclusion, data, 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 another part of a conclusion. In its entirety, all the information is there. It's hard to follow, not client friendly. Okay? Um, a good close would be conclusion, three relevant pieces of data that directly support that conclusion. And a great close would be a conclusion with a dis definitive action recommendation, right? and three pieces of data that are logically related to that conclusion. So it's the logic is really very clear and very compelling. <coughs> and uh, I'll give you an example of that. Um, so I have this hypothetical situation. I know. You can't deliver it. Um, but I can read it this way. Because it's, it's too small to print and you won't be able to see it. And, I have this hypothetical situation where I, got two, I have two daughters, and I'm sort of envisioning this situation sort of in the future uh, and, and sort of trying to make it interesting, so make the point. Um, my youngest one comes to me and says, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. I'm like, what, honey? What, honey? Um, I'm sorry. Okay? It was an accident. But my, my sister made me do it. We weren't trying to. It was an accident. Not my fault. Her fault. Okay? I know. Candles. No. Bad idea. Matches. I know. But... She pushed me. She did, really, right? Oh, I, I, I'm coughing a lot. <coughs> Help. What, do I, what should I do? Okay. That's a poor close. Because you have no idea what the hell is going on, right? A lot of information, no conclusion, no action, right? Okay. Um, the, the next one, the, the, my, 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 my older daughter comes to me and says, Dad, the house is on fire. We were playing with matches. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's like a conclusion, action driven, right? <laughs> and then uh, the, the babysitter comes down, who's trying to train to be a management consultant, and says, Mr. Chang, you don't have to read this. Uh, the house is on fire. It's in fact burning to the ground quickly, and it cannot be saved. You have no other choice than to get the heck out of here ne right now. Okay? Good recommendation, action, conclusion. There are three reasons why I feel this way. <laughs> Let me show you my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, slide one, please. The fire will consume the house in less than one minute. This is based on the fact that it's moving at 10 feet every five seconds, and I've measured the width of the house to be 120 feet. We got less than 60 seconds to live. <laughs> Number two, supporting point. Putting out the fire is, in fact, not possible. Okay? The fire is too big at this point to put out, plus the fire extinguisher is at the opposite end of the house. And guess what, Mr. Chang? I've been watching you work out. You're not as quite as fast as you used to be on the treadmill. <laughs> you won't make it. Great. Third supporting point, third slide, please. Uh, your only remaining option is to save you and your kids now. In fact, the supporting point is, you promised your wife you'd take care of the kids. If you leave them in a burning house and go put out the fire, she will kill you. <laughs> Therefore, the conclusion is, you have no other choice than to get the heck out of here. Okay? And that's like the rhythm of a good close. Right? And you can obviously tweak and make it better. Um, but the idea is sort of main idea with a clear action, 
why you feel that way, and then restate the, the conclusion. But you see the difference, right? And, and there's interesting, I mean, I have relatives who, are, who, who, who think this way on the poor clothes, and actually my mother-in-law. <laughs> uh, and it's just like, I, 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 my limit's like seven minutes. I can listen to seven minutes of, well, first I went to the parking lot, and then I went in, and then this happened. Oh, and there was this really interesting lady I talked to. Oh, did you realize that she has a dog? And just like, and what? What's the point, mom? Uh, oh, we need more toilet paper. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I can take care of that. Right? And, but she had to sort of tell the whole story. Um, and so, it, not that it's right or wrong, it's different, but in consulting, that doesn't work because it's not client friendly, you can't follow it. 